I see a lot of you, a lot of familiar faces. Thank you for coming out in this heat. I am going to talk about um, joys of gardening. All of you are here because you love to garden. All of you are here and maybe some of you have actually had some accidents in the garden. <laughs> um, they say you should talk about what you know and I really do know how to injure myself in the garden. If you volunteered with me, you probably know that and have witnessed. And also, I would like to talk about the benefits of gardening at the end, just to sort of finish it off. Um, this basically is um, a little synopsis. This is the house that my great-grandparents um, actually built and why that's important. This is where I spent my childhood learning about gardening and farming. Um, last year, witnessing something that many people will not witness maybe ever again, I don't know. Um, the last time I gave a presentation, it was in front of 200 people. The Dean of Nursing was standing beside me and actually fainted. Um, now, Chris did tell me he might bubble wrap me, but it's too hot to wear that, so I'm just gonna go with the flow and get through this with you. Uh, my credentials basically lived and played on 70 acres. I was a nurse for 34 years. Um, that is a long time as a nurse. And I do injure myself more than anybody else I know. <laughs> I fell by it genetically. My, my, uh, my grandmother, Daisy, Daisy Klutz. Oh, can you not hear me? I have a loud voice. A little quiet in the back. <laughs> Daisy Klutz was my grandmother. My father's middle name was Klutz. I come from a long line of Klutzes. <laughs> if you read the actual description, I'm gonna let you read it, that basically is me. This is my, oh, sorry, that was my knee. Um, I used to do half marathons, and not more than maybe even a quarter mile into a 14 mile run, I fell and scraped both knees and had to finish the rest of the run all scraped up and bleeding. Um, Nurses and gardeners have a lot in common, believe it or not. We like to wear gloves to protect ourselves. We, um, we both appreciate the um, healing power of plants. We like to nurture. And we're also interested in the pH. It's very important to both of us. According to the North Carolina Extension Gardener Handbook, our North Carolina soil is um, a acidic soil. It's somewhere between 4.5 to 5. That's the range. Um, as far as nurses, we strive to keep our patients' pH around 7.4. If it goes too low, they might have respiratory acidosis. If the, um, the plants we want to have theirs, their um, pH somewhere between 6 to 7.5, that is optimal. However, there are a lot of plants that love the acidic soil. I know there are people who say, oh, I grow camellias and gardenias and all these other acidic loving plants. That's another thing. Oh, one more thing I want to ask. How many of you have done a soil sample? Raise your hands. If you haven't, I do have some soil sample kits in the back you can take home with you. Um, another thing we worry about as nurses and gardeners is hydration. <laughs> if our, um, if our plants don't get enough water, they're not going to be able to get the nutrition they need, they're not going to be able to grow and flourish like they should. Also, if they get too much, they might get root rot. Same thing with patients. If the patients get um, too much water, they're going to get overloaded and have heart issues. And also, if it's too low, they're going to get dehydrated. This is my family farmland. It was built in 1860 in Alamance County. My um, grandfather, great-grandfather, built this house here with the barn at the same time. There's a smokehouse, and there's probably about 15 acres, acres right there um, where we played and, and enjoyed ourselves, gardened. We also had aunts and uncles that lived on the same road. This is back in North Carolina in the rural area. We all sort of lived on the same road. We worked together and gardened together. Um, that being said, ah, I'm pointing at this. Um, I did find a little oral history about my 
great grandfather. Don't worry, it's not going to be about my family, Emily, I promise. Um, this is my grandmother, the little girl in the picture, and this is um, H. Truitt, who used to raise vegetables and fruits. He had chickens, he had um, butter and cows, horses. He would, um, he would um, bring a wagon of vegetables and fruits, whatever was in season, to the three mills in, North, in um, Burlington, North Carolina, which is a big mill town, and he would sell it on Tuesdays and Thursdays. There's a lot more to that interview, but we won't go into that. Um, all of us have a special place that we grew up and enjoyed. I'm taking a quote from Elizabeth Lawrence. Edith will be happy to hear that one. <laughs> um, there's a garden in every childhood, an enchanted place where colors are brighter, the air is softer, and the mornings more fragrant than ever again. This is my poor um, second cousin who was having to tote me around in the wheel, I mean the um, wagon there. Later on he had to take me to high school. So he couldn't get away from that. Um, there are people that actually teach us about gardening and our, and our love of gardening. My mother was that for me. She, um, she was a biology teacher. She also worked as a head of a department at Carolina Biological. And the plant press was something that we always took on any trip. We would put it in the car, go to the mountains, stop every now and then, gather the plants and press them. Later on, we would try to identify them. Um, this is my grandfather. He is another person who had a great influence on me. That is not a dunce hat. That is actually um, a made hat, birthday hat that the kids made. It looks suspect, but I just wanted to make that, <laughs> make that noted. Um, also, he was a, a mailman for 35 years. He loved to fish. He had a pond in the back. He actually had a, a rod shop, I'll show you later. It's called Zim's Rod Shop. I may have already showed it. Um, we grew up with fields of flowers and, and vegetables. We foraged for food. We thought we were foraging for food. We would go out and we would get cherry tomatoes, muscadines from the vine. Um, we could actually eat uh, sugar snaps fresh out of the garden and many other things, fig trees, well, we didn't need the pecans off the tree. Um, we also had the clover fields that my grandfather used for cover crop. In North Carolina, you use many different things, but his choice was the red clover, which was, at that time, I thought knee high for us. We would run through the clover and hide there. Other great garden memories, making um, necklaces and chains out of clover. How many of you have done that before? Sure. And um, I don't know if any of you made guns out of narrow leaf plantains, <laughs> but they really make great guns. Oh yeah, there you go, Edith, thank you. Mm. But if you fold it in half and you snap it really fast, it will go 10 feet. Yeah. Make great guns for people who don't have such things. Um, also, that's my son who loved to, to eat pansies. <laughs> he, eat, he eats everything. but. You have to watch him in the garden. Now on to hazards in the garden. This is what probably some of you have experienced. I've experienced my, my share. My first memory was we used to have chestnut tree grove. And our job as children were to go out there, gather up the chestnuts, put it in the bucket so that they could later take out the nuts and we could roast it them in the fire later. Um, very dangerous job for a kid with no shoes, which is basically how we like to travel back then. My first volunteer day at Plant Delights, I was in the pseudo garden, and I wasn't paying attention as I sometimes do. I was talking. I happened to back <laughs> off, and I did get one of the um, thorns in my bottom side. Mm -hmm. Well, that being said, Amanda has um, agreed to be my wear protective clothes when in the garden. This is Amanda. She is the manager at Plant Delight. 
She's showing us that you do need the chaps, you need the gloves, and there are other items that probably I'm not naming that you do need, like pliers. And on that day, I actually injured myself too. I think I was talking, not paying attention, I backed up and, and hit the prickly pears. Um, cacti spines and thorn removal, you need, I don't know if we had this at Plant Delights or here at the Arboretum, but they recommend rubber glue, Elmer's glue, put gauze over it. Once the gauze and the glue um, solidifies, you pull it off. Um, you can use tweezers and antiseptic, antibiotics might be needed. You need to make sure you have your tetanus shot. How many of you have your tetanus shot? Well, you are much better than me. <laughs> we have agaves in Plant Delights, too, to work with. And one day, I decided to um, pull back really hard, and there was a, um, a spike here, agave, that is. This one over here on the bottom corner. And I'm not sure, mangavi, agave. I think this is an agave. But um, what happened was I poked my finger, and it didn't look like much. The next day I woke up and I didn't have any ridges here on my knuckles. My knuckles weren't showing. I had um, a lot of swelling. Went to the doctor. I said, well, I'll just get it checked off because it's very painful. He said, you really, if you're in the garden, you need to have your tetanus shot. So I got a tetanus shot. Also, I, he started me on antibiotics. Antiseptics is another thing. Why do we worry about tetanus? Because it lives in the soil. And you can get the tetanus uh, four to ten days up to three months later. It's, this um, mm. grotesque grinning smile is actually a classic sign of tetanus. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't go away immediately. If people come into the ER smiling, we know there's a problem. <laughs> um, <laughs> stiffness of the neck, the jaw, and other muscles is another thing. Uh, difficulty swallowing. And you're irritable. Why would you not be irritable if you're smiling like that, though? I don't know. Um, once the tetanus toxin has bonded to your nerve endings, it's almost impossible to remove it. It takes a while. You have to wait for your nerves to regenerate. And um, it takes months for that to happen, and it's a painful process. Another reason to get your tetanus shot. Also, I've been in the garden, and Plant Delights is a dangerous place for me, but <laughs> <laughs> they have berms, and we were weeding, and I don't know what I was doing, usually chatting, and somehow I slid down the berm into an anthill. This is before you were here. Slid down? Slid down the berm slid into down. an ant nest, and um, this is an actual bite. This is like five minutes and 30 minutes out. It doesn't take long for me to react to things, it seems. Um, I don't know if you know this, but two to three percent of people are allergic to fire ant venom. They can have an anaphylactic reaction. They're nasty little creatures. They actually will bite you with the mandibles and they'll stick you or prick you with the stinger. Um, they're found in 75 to 100 counties in North Carolina and spreading. What you should do, and I think somebody asked me this earlier, when you see a mound like this, you should treat it. They recommend putting the bait around the mound and wait about five to seven days and then doing a drenching. We also have spiders in North Carolina that we need to be aware of. The brown recluse spiders on the left and then we have the black widow on the right. If you are bitten by a spider, you need to, if you can, safely get a spider into a container and take it in. It's nice to identify them. Some of them will cause necrosis, skin breakdown. So it's important to know what you're dealing with. They can cause muscular um, pain and some numbness, tingling. I also have a sweet dog. Yes. I have a question. Do they find brown recluse outside or is it more indoors? Well, it's recluse because it likes to hide. And that's a good question. I think that I have seen that they, they hide in mulch sometimes and under, um, not eaves. Yes, under the house a little bit sometimes. I wish I knew that answer, I'm sorry. Does someone else know that answer? 
I would say they're everywhere. I've been bitten by one hanging up laundry one time. And they're so painful, and they can be really mm -hmm. nasty bites, yeah. too. Outside, outside. Um, we have a dog. The dog likes to dig. I like to garden. Sometimes they don't mix because we actually had a yellow jacket nest that the dog dug up. I happened to be outside. I felt the, someone said it earlier, it, it's, a, it's a really nasty sting. And they, there's not just one. Usually when they sting you, they put a chemical into your system which makes all the other yellow jackets want to follow you. So you need to run. This is I thought, well, I'll go ahead and I'll get an allergy test. I'm always being stung or bitten. So the first one was actually the time that they gave it to me. That was within three minutes, the second one, and the third one was within five. I'm pretty allergic to hornets, um, wasp, and ant venom. And I'm definitely someone who, who um, mosquitoes love. Yellow jacket wasp, you can apply treatments or foams spray the hole, you want to stay back, you don't want to get close. I put the bottom on there because my, my um, husband read this and thought that was the way to go. So you never put gasoline or kerosene in a hole. It's the engineer in it, he wanted to put the gas in there, cover it up with something. He did do it at night, he did read that part. And uh, it does poison the soil, so you really don't want to go there. Controlling the yellow jackets with wasp and hornet sprays containing mint oil, permethrin, tetramethrin, or talamethrin. I'm probably not saying that last one right. <laughs> Is the way to go. I don't know if you guys get bitten. Hold your hands up if you are susceptible to mosquitoes. The ones that are not holding your hands up, I'm really jealous. They're attracted to dark colors. They, um, the women, or the women, the female mosquitoes are the ones that actually bite. They're looking for proteins to feed their babies. 20% of the people are more attracted to mosquitoes. I'm one of them. Type O blood is more susceptible to attract them. Mm. Also, I think B and A is less likely. 85% of the people are genetically more, um, likely to secrete chemicals they're attracted to, like uric acids, ammonias. It's usually people, I like to say in the South, women glow, we don't sweat. But I, I glow a lot, so I'm susceptible to bites. Also, genetics play a role in it, 85% of the time. Warmer body temperatures, high metabolism. If you're pregnant, you're more likely to get bitten. And if you wear black, blue, or red, which are my favorite colors in the garden, but I no longer like them anymore. <laughs> I'm going with white. One of the things to do for mosquitoes is basically to um, tip and toss, prevent. It takes about seven to 10 days for a mosquito to mature from egg to the adult. And so if you empty the water, you're more likely to um, get rid of the issue. The repellents that work, according to research, are the keratin, and there's a little container up there. I don't think you can see it because of the light, but when the lights come on, you're welcome to look at it. Off, DEET. The DEET, the mosquitoes can land on you, but they won't bite with the DEET. The keratin, they'll usually stay away from you for up to 12 hours, and the um, more homeopathic way to treat it would be the eucalyptus lemon. I know a lot of people worry about putting chemicals on their skin. DEET has been associated with some neuromuscular. There was research, I think they disputed that. But I don't like putting chemicals on anyway. There's also, and this was researched, a perfume at Victoria's Secret called Bombshell. I haven't tried that one out, but <laughs> worth a try. I, I attended the Master Gardener um, College just recently. I am a new Master Gardener, so I found this very interesting. How many of you have Beautyberry in your yard? Start crushing the leaves, putting it on you, because it's an excellent mosquito repellent. It has um, three different chemicals that they have extracted, and all of them deter the um, 
mosquito. And they're pretty. Products that just don't work. The um, citronella candle. The bracelets. They'll land on the bracelets. They bite you anyway. And there's also vitamin B skin patches. And there was, at some point, they had these ultrasonic devices that people said the tones would, would keep the mosquitoes away. It doesn't work. <coughs> There's one more. Oh yeah, the little fan that people put on their belt that people swear by. They say if you're in one area, like if you're at a ball game, it might work. But if you're moving around, they're going to bite you. This is rue. Rue is a wonderful plant. I heard that it keeps mosquitoes away. There's other plants that do, like basil, garlic, lavender, peppermint, rosemary, and others. There's a whole list. I thought, well, if it keeps mosquitoes away, I'm going bike riding, I'm going to put it on the back of my neck. So I rubbed it on the back of my neck. You know where I'm going with that. Went for a bike ride, had no problem. Now, I'm a nurse, we wear stethoscopes around our neck. The next day, one of my friends went by and says, oh, Kathy, what is on the back of your neck? Unfortunately, it causes blistering and something called phytophotodermatitis. Phyto meaning plant, photo meaning light, dermatitis meaning skin inflammation. <coughs> the symptoms of that usually begin 24 hours, which is why I didn't notice it right away. I felt itching, but you know, for me, I get bitten all the time, so I didn't think a thing about it. 48 to 72 hours, it can turn into something that looks like this, and that doesn't go away immediately. It may take months for it to go away. I really thought I was going to be scarred for life. <laughs> Other things that have the um, sorosin, which is a photosensitizer, are lime, carrots, celery, parsley, and parsnips. Some of the common plants that contain this, there's a list. Hogweed is a really nasty one. And I don't know if we have much of that here. I think it's in Virginia, is what I understand. But if you see a plant that looks a little like this, stay away from it. Do not. It, it can cause severe blistering. Another thing we don't think of is garden compost. You can actually get a bacteria from opening it and um, breathing in the spores. People who have COPD, elderly patients, immunosuppressed people, and smokers are more at risk for this. It re requires intensive care treatment. And it's more common in New Zealand and Australia. And I think that you, the guys that went to um, New Zealand did visit a compost place while they were there. 90% of the cases are caused by um, the Legionella pneumophilia and not the Legionella lumbecchia, which is what I'm talking about that is found in the compost. Ticks, we all know about ticks. Um, they cause the Lyme's disease, Rocky Mountain spotted fever. I like to garden again. I was out there shredding leaves. I took my shower, went to bed, woke up. I had, I was in the shower. I didn't have my glasses or contacts on. And I noticed a black dot in between my fingers, a tiny little black dot. I thought, well, what is that? A piece of dirt, I must have missed it or something. Started rubbing it, never came off got my glasses on, and it was this teeny little tick right here had bitten me. So I went to the doctor again, my hands full up, you know, just went there and he put me on doxycycline. Doxycycline at 100 milligrams can actually cause photosensitivity. So when you're on doxycycline, heed the warning, wear SPF clothing, hat, sunscreen, because you can get blistering. I don't know if you can actually see what's on this tree. He's pretty well hidden. It's a copperhead. Um, there, there are nasty little snakes. There, there are several, but this is the one that people encounter the most. They like to um, hide under shrubbery. People will put their hands under there. And, and get bitten. The juvenile copperhead has like a little yellow tail, and you think this is juvenile, it's safer, but actually the juveniles 
don't have any control over their venom and they're more likely to release more venom and you're going to have a worse reaction. The, the bad thing about a copperhead bite is you need to get into the hospital within six hours to get the antivenom. And antivenom is not a cheap thing to produce. It's very expensive. Your hospital stay will be expensive. We had someone that was bitten at Plant Delights on the hand and the foot, and I think the cost of that was like a hundred thousand dollars. Easily, each vial costs two to three thousand dollars. It takes at least twenty vials to even treat you, and that's not even counting the ER visits and your doctor visits and whatnot. So prevention is the best. We also have non-poisonous snakes. If you see these snakes, don't kill them. We had the green snakes and on the, I love this one, I got this from Kathy at Plant Delights. She has a, a picture where the black snake is eating a copperhead, which is why I do love black snakes. They're non-poisonous, they eat other snakes. These snakes were all seen within a week of each other last year. I took all the pictures because I like to take pictures of snakes. Yes. I have heard having an antihistamine or Benadryl handy. My, being a nurse, mm -hmm. do you have any thoughts on that? You yes. Know. You should have. I mean, it's always helpful for a lot of things. Bites, stings. But it's best if you're bitten by a copperhead to go into the hospital. Oh, definitely. Someone yeah. just said if you're like an hour away, it doesn't hurt to give No, some. it never hurts to take Benadryl. It's an antihistamine. It helps your... Um, slow it down. and Slow it down. Okay. Exactly. Great point. Um, if you're bitten by a snake, you want to take off watches, rings, anything that might constrict. You want to call 911. You want to get to the ER within six hours. And you want to keep your arm lower than your heart. I know that when I was growing up, they used to say you cut the you cut above it, you use tourniquets, you suck out the venom. Don't do any of that. That's all wrong. <laughs> Keep the person calm. And I know we all know poison ivy. Poison ivy is a rash by an oil that's found in plants and it's caused by an oil called Urushol. And I'm probably saying that wrong. Um, most people see the rash go away in a couple of weeks. I had, um, here are the signs, sorry. Signs are itching, redness, hives, you read it. A lot of you have encountered this. This is my son. My son was helping me out in February. I thought, February, you're okay to go out there and pull down any of the, I know, <laughs> the uh, poison ivy vines because there's no leaves on there, right? Well, that's when the oils are concentrated in the um, actual stems more. So it's actually worse to deal with poison ivy at that time. My son was out there and I don't know what he did. I think he probably um, carried something over, got it on his clothes, went to bed. He had a tendency to suck his fingers, sorry. Um, the next day he went to school and when he came back home from the bus, because he didn't look like this the next day, <laughs> he had a major reaction, itching, blistering rash, 12 to 72 hours. I don't know why they didn't call me, but I took the child directly to the doctor because as you see, he has some throat swelling, his eyes were closed, his mouth was tiny at that time. And just to show you, that was the before picture and that's the after. So again, be careful of poison ivy. Some people are much more um, prone to have an allergic reaction. You can treat it within 10 minutes. If I knew he had um, come into contact with it, I could have washed his hands with rubbing alcohol, made sure he had a shower within 60 minutes, put cold compresses, and given him some Benadryl, best thing. And baking soda is really good. It keeps the itching from occurring. A lot of us already know that we need to be careful in the sun. There was a handout out there in the back that's uh, heat-related illnesses. A lot of us are concerned when you start having a headache outside when you're working, if you're not hydrating enough, you need to come inside. That is the first sign of dehydration and, and the um, first sign that you're getting into trouble. 
We need to wear sunglasses out in the sun because you can even get um, melanoma in the eyes. You need to apply um, SPF of at least 30% and reapply every 30 to 30 minutes. And I don't, oh, I'm sorry, 15 to 30 minutes before you go out, you want to put on the sunscreen and reapply every two hours. Wear your hats, protective gear, and try to avoid being out during the peak hours, which is between uh, 10 and 2. Another accident. <laughs> We have a very steep incline on the left side of this house, and um, we have a lot of white oaks. White oaks produce a lot of acorns. This picture over here is a picture of the acorns after my husband blowed it off of the lawn. I, however, didn't think, and I was mowing the yard down an incline, slipped, fell, jammed my heel into the lawnmower. It did not go into it and landed on the hip and ended up having to have physical therapy. So as we get older, we have to think about what we're doing. Going up the hill, I actually flipped a wheelbarrow. But <laughs> We also have to be aware of rakes. Rakes, times go down, not up. I've heard that ever since I was a child. But you'd be surprised at how many people come into the ER and have to have a rake surgically removed. Benefits of gardening. Why do I keep gardening after all these injuries? <laughs> you would wonder. Um, regular gardening and sun exposure increases the vitamin D and um, calcium absorption. You also have a lower um, percentage of dementia. It lowers it by 36%. That's high. That's huge. Also, um, it's it fights stress. I think all of us know that the the digging and the pulling and the weeding and it kind of helps you get out any kind of anger issues you might have at the time. <laughs> Not that I have them, but just saying. Um, gardening decreases stress hormone, cortisone, and it's a great form of exercise. It helps with mental health. This is my dog, Bug Bugsy, and I swear to goodness, I did not name Pug Bugsy. Pugsy and Bugsy. I got him, we rescued the dog in the middle. The cat on the left is, I think, Jasper is Jasper. from Plant Delights. <laughs> and that cat loves the garden. Mm -hmm. Basically, it releases happy hormones for dogs and people. You can see the poor dog that had to stay inside looking out the window. <laughs> it's looking so pitiful. Um, the level of cortisol is, is um, lower, and that's always associated with stress, so it's nice to have that. And again, you can take out your frustrations. Gardening teaches responsibility, planning, and a love of nature. These are my kids. They've been subjected to nature and gardening all their life. Actually, the littlest one I had in a bassinet with a screen over him out there in the garden when I was gardening when I was younger. They love plants. They like to, I think they were excited about the cannon there, though. <laughs> Um, oh. The love of gardening is a seed, once sown, never dies. That's a quote from Gertrude Jekyll. I didn't care if my kids got messy. It's okay. Every day in the garden, I don't know if you like to go out in your garden and see what's in bloom for the day, what's flowering, what creatures <coughs> you might find in the garden. There's turtles, and I don't know if you can see the lizard right there. There's a lizard right there. I almost pulled him by accident while I was. <laughs> I have I have chopped a snake in half by accident. Um, Luna moss. This one was at the arboretum. This little frog I about killed. We were cutting back things, and I think his eyes are wide open because he realized what a close miss. Gardeners love pollinators. Amanda. The butterfly loved you that day, following you around. And um, there are no gardening mistakes in the experiments. I actually brought an experiment. I took a class here at the Arboretum, great place to take classes. Um, propagation of ferns through uh, with spores. And there's an example of that actually on the table. Also, I took a propagation class with Chris. And this, this hay bale garden was sort of a failure. 
that I thought, well, I'll try it. It did okay for the squash, but squash flopped over. The deer thought it was a buffet bar, and they just kept coming by and eating my <laughs> tomato plants. I kept replacing them. I never got a decent tomato off of it. So we always try. We may not always succeed. This is a lovely garden. I'm sure most of you have seen it because I, I, I see a lot of volunteers. But if you haven't, you need to check it out. <laughs> One of, the, one of the great reasons to be a member, you get to have the plant give away annually. It's usually, I think, in October. First Saturday. First Saturday in October. It's a great way to get nine plants that you may not get out there in the public nurseries. And it's always a little fun and dangerous. It only lasts 15 minutes, I think. I think the preparation is always more. And don't ever take a sheet with your plant list on it. That never works. I'm telling you that. <laughs> this, these plants are from the Plant Delights, another great garden you need to visit. They um, are looking for money for an endowment fund, not to plug that, but it's um, a great garden to support. Also, we all volunteer for different reasons. I've met so many great friends. Some of them are here from Plant Delights and from um, J.C. Roston. I recognize a lot of you. And basically, I just want you to remember to garden as though you'll, you'll live forever. It's a quote by William Kent. And those two were from Plant Delight. That actually was from Overdose. This guy, I just had to take a picture of him. It's a plant man. I don't even know what he's supposed to be. But he was in, I think, Portugal. And that's it. I hope there's at least three things you got from this. Whether it's I'm a klutz, I can cook, or whatever. <laughs> yes. I think there's a difference of what kind of uh, insecticide you should use if you're putting your skin versus clothing. Yes, the, and that's a good point. I actually bought the wrong one once. Um, I think it's Perethrin, Perethrin, I got that and I think it's supposed to be on the clothes. You're supposed to put it on clothes and camping and I thought, I'm going to buy that. It's supposed to be really good. I went home, it says, do not apply to skin. I don't have an example of that. I do have the one that you can put on your skin, the Picaridin. You have an example. Of that. That's a good point. I did not know that. I, I learned by my mistakes. I don't know if you've gathered this yet, but I'm one of those gardeners that I do the wrong thing when I say, yes. yes. Um, a point about yeah. the mosquito repellent um, at Juniper Level, we're trying the garlic. And it stinks. Uh, garlic spray, it stinks. It does. Um, but we actually found it was 99% it was um, oil derived from garlic and 1% lemon. And we applied it, and it has actually worked for more than two weeks with irrigation going every other day. I meant so. to mention that, Where and I apply? smelled that while they and were spraying, and I would stay away from it. It's strong. It is. So it was either a love, either you loved it or you hated it. It either made, and it made everybody hungry, whether or not you liked it. <laughs> There's a strange feeling to like eat all of the Italian food in this world. Um, but uh, no, we it, and it was a it was a it was a spray on the on the plant material. So we just sprayed everything within a sprayable area. Had a backpack sprayer and just mixed it and sprayed it on all of the leaf material. We let it dry for 24 hours, and then after that, we could irrigate and. We have we have not seen any you know mosquitoes come back and it's been about two weeks which has wow. been you know been pretty good for our garden considering how wet and wet it's day. organic. Um, I do not know our IPM person is the guy to ask, <laughs> but he found it you know because we were looking for alternatives to um, some of the nastier sprays and we do we use dunks in the water but um, we're able to reduce the amount of dunks we're able to where we had to use. Um, and it's just much safer. I mean, all it is is garlic. I mean, literally, r label 99.9% .9 garlic, 1% lemon. <laughs> so, then, how about the other pollinators? Yes, it is. No, the oh. other insects just ignored it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, again, yeah, no, we were still very biodiverse. <laughs> was that a commercial product? Edith, you it had was, a make it yourself. It was a commercial product, but I would not be surprised if you could access it. Uh, I want to say it's a commercial product. It's called Mosquito Barrier. 
Yeah, I don't know if that's what yeah. our brand but, was. But, but it's, but it's the, but anyway, that, that one also is the garlic. Yeah. And um, it gets sprayed on my garden. Um, I took this up because my little cat was getting bitten so badly when she went out by the mosquitoes. And um, my neighbor had done this, so he could sit on his new patio. And so I thought, well, I'll, I'll try this, and I called. And, um, and I have it sprayed every three weeks. Mm -hmm. It takes, uh, if it you know, doesn't get wet, as you said, about an hour and a half to dry. Um, and it seems really effective. Mm -hmm. and I really don't notice the smell. Um, after, it goes, yeah, after, after about two hours? Yes, yeah, about two hours, it's gone. So it's been, been highly effective in my cat. Here's, started looking much more normal. <laughs> and her little dogs. Yeah. So I wouldn't I, I would if you have a if you have a company that you trust, I would ask them if they would use it. It's it's kind of an unusual one because it is, you know, probably more holistic and sometimes it's not always the thing that people go towards, but um, if you I trust know, somebody. I know they use garlic like even in organic apple orchards mm -hmm. and things like that for I think it's antifungal, but it might be anti uh, bacterial. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it is a potent chemical, even though oh, yeah. it's natural. So you just yeah. want to find out as much as totally. you can about it. No, our, our, no, we, yes. you know, we are still not allowed to spray within 12 feet of people. You know, our IPM person was still wearing all of the proper PPE, you know, covering all of all of his, you know, arms and hands, and mixed it, you know, using, um, you know, a. Uh, Elbow length gloves, you know. Totally. You had a question. Yeah, I just wanted to say, um, if you have a dog, um, I wouldn't use it because garlic is toxic to dogs. Mm -hmm. I've had a dog; wow. she's almost 14, so I kind of memorized a list over the years. You know, you check, but yeah, that might be. I don't know about inhaling it. You know, I would definitely check with that with the dog. Well, thank you for coming. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> the big flower your mom was holding in one of the first slides, can you confirm what that was? Do you remember? A, a paper flower. <laughs> yes, she's creative. It was one of those tissue flowers back in the 60s they used to yeah. make flowers. She is very creative. So. Her and favorite. The, yeah. And this is your book that you showed? Yeah, actually the book um, that we used to gather the, the plants and, and um, press them. That's the book that we used. It's actually an antique like I am. And the actual book in the middle is the, uh, my grandfather's favorite book, the Organic Gardening book. It was put out in 1970. So it's almost an antique itself. And then of course I brought some lotions that you can use to treat the poison ivy. And that's my attempt at um, propagating ferns from Spores. Not a bad one. I think it did really well. <laughs> oh, one other comment I had. People's oh. Pharmacy is a good source of checking, like, mm -hmm. just what you have on hand if you get a burn or something. I had a bee sting and I went to People's Pharmacy. It says milk and magnesia. I had some, I think it was 10 years old. I thought, well, I'll try it anyhow. And it worked. It didn't swell up as much. Mm -hmm. and it didn't hurt like it normally does. Homopathic is good. And I think Gina had a question mm -hmm. or answer. I was just wondering about um, the Virginia creeper and some of those other vines that are supposed to have an irritating sap to them. They do. I didn't cover. There was a lot. Actually, there's a lot of injuries that I had to cover because I'm very prone to them. So I wanted to keep everything on a timeline. So I didn't cover everything. <laughs> I didn't even cover all my injuries. <laughs> But um, yes, the, the Virginia creeper is one of the ones. Um, Carolina jasmine. Carolina jasmine. There's a lot of plants that, um, if you've ever read Amy Stewart's book, she has a great book about plants, dangerous plants, and I can't remember the exact title, but she has one about bugs and one about plants. And uh, it's excellent reading. I wish I had brought it. I actually have it in the car. <laughs> The Virginia creeper was not really toxic. Or is it it's just a certain people? I pull it up sure. by my hands. It's in certain people. Does it? Yeah, it's in the creeper. It would probably be toxic to me if it's certain people. <laughs> certain people.
Sorry. <laughs> My husband's very allergic to poison ivy. I'm immune. Yeah. I think. God. But he said a really, really hot shower to kind of pull out the histamines. Is that, would you think is that a hot shower versus uh, just a shower? I haven't, I, I couldn't find research on hot or cold shower. Just a shower for sure within. To, to wash Yeah, to off. wash off the oils that are there. There's also a product that Tech New makes. I know I'm not supposed to mention products, but I just did. Um, it has like a scrub that you can scrub the um, the area, and it'll actually dry out the urosol and um, wash it away. I um I do have a comment on that. Um, cold showers are better. Oh, there you um, go. I I so my first internship at Duke Gardens. I thought I was going to be a hero and I was going to pull up all the poison ivy and go wash my arms off and I ended up having to go to the hospital. Nope. Um, so my arms swelled up three times the normal size. Um, and they were very adamant, do not take hot showers. Hmm. Like, like well, thank loop, you for letting warm at warmest. Yes? I, I think that's because just, uh, the it is worse if you burn it. So you definitely don't want to burn it. It shouldn't be. No, that's one of the worst ways to get it actually is aerosol. And you don't want anything that aerosolizes it at all. Including steamy showers. I think in my experience, your pets can bring it to you too, can't they? Yes, they can get it on their fur. And I don't know how Brian got it. It could have been. We had cats, and the cats would go all through the woods, and then he would rub the cats. I just, I don't know how he got it. But you can get it off of other objects. They say you can't get it from other people. Like if someone has poison ivy, if you touch it, it doesn't transfer over. I guess the oil is probably the oil there is all once the, it's in. Yeah, yeah the oil um, is all, and I can't remember exactly what the reason. I did a lot of research. I probably remember half of what I read. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yes? What about eucalyptus oil? Do they not use that? Eucalyptus oil for mosquitoes? Uh -huh. Yes. Matter of fact, I think there's a product by Cutter. They have eucalyptus and lemon. Mm -hmm. It smells, but it works. <laughs> Looks like that's it, Kathy. All Thank right. you so very much.